Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, um, I want to thank you so much for that introduction. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I am Justin Croft from Syntec Instrumentation, who's bringing you this webinar today. And I am going to speak about automated colony counting, uh, new methods, and how they're saving researchers time and cost, uh, with the focus of today's talk being on manual versus automated counting methods. So what am I going to cover today? Well, um, in this talk, I will give a general overview of spheroid and colony counting assays. Uh, I then plan to speak about the manual counting method and some of the inherent issues with counting colonies that way. Uh, I want to then compare the manual counting methods with automated counting procedures. And I'm going to follow this up with a quick demo of some actual colony counting software, which is uh, in this case, the gel count. So with that, let's begin. So as we all likely have an idea about what clonogenic or spheroid assays are all about, I'm going to try and keep this section relatively short and to the point. Um, now, just as a side note, while I will speak mostly about clonogenic assays moving forward, um, please do note uh, that most everything I mention here can be translated to things like organoids. Uh, and we do have plenty of researchers using systems like this uh, for, uh, to get their organ organoid numbers and sizes. So with that, um, in recent years, uh, we have seen an explosion of new discoveries in relation to the diverse molecular and biological changes underlying cancer, uh, toxicology, and organoid development even. Um, these insights are changing our understanding of the complex pathways that regulate these various cell biologies, meaning Research labs today are translating these findings into novel approaches towards helping us understand a wide array of diagnoses, prognoses, and therapies. However, these developments are generating some fundamental operational challenges for labs. Um, an expanding number of treatment drug therapy options and trial candidates further means the colony formation assay uh, is really mounting in scale and complexity as researchers, uh, such as yourselves, attempt to evaluate an increasing number of variables. Now, the colony forming unit or colony forming cell assay has really become universally recognized as the gold standard method uh, for measuring the effects of things like radiation, chemotherapeutic drugs, and other agents on cell viability. Now, as you likely know, there are two types of colony formation assays available to you. Uh, there are 2D or adherent colony assays where colonies grow in a monolayer on a plate. And then there are 3D or non-adherent colony assays where colonies grow in a soft agar in three-dimensional space. Now, both assays have been widely used, but the preference uh, today of researchers seems to be leaning more towards the 3D version of this assay. And the general reason for this is compared to cells grown in 2D monolayers, the 3D growth conditions much more accurately reflect the natural env environment of cells in vivo and therefore offer a much better representation of what may be seen in future animal studies. Now, the real downside of 3D assays is they are often slower, more labor intensive, more imprecise, and more inconsistent because of the subjective definitions of colonies. So probably the most labor intensive part of either a 2D or 3D assay is the actual counting of these colonies across hundreds or in some cases, even thousands of plates. Um, 2D assays are stained and can be counted relatively quickly by scanning the bottom of plates. Now, depending on the size of these colonies, a microscope may or may not be used to count the colonies. On the other hand, 3D colony assays are often harder to stain and almost always require an intensive process to count the colonies. Now, because they are free-floating spheroids, the diameter of these colonies is oftentimes much smaller than their 2D counterparts, which spread across a solid plate. So for 3D colony assays, a microscope is almost always needed to count the colonies. And this is a truly labor-intensive process. And perhaps some of you have done this, but it requires a trained individual that is not only good at moving the microscope efficiently across an X and Y axis to count the colonies, but they must also adjust the depth or Z axis to ensure they count all colonies within the 3D matrix. So while the manual counting scenario uh, has been and continues to be challenging enough in the monolayer two-dimensional samples, 
Uh, in recent years, um, as I just mentioned, sphere formation in 3D assays, which more realistically simulates tissue state, have become increasingly popular with cell biologists. These three-dimensional cultures accurately visual, or sorry, in these 3D cultures, accurate visual recognition of these colonies requires the use of a microscope, making consistent manual counting dramatically more labor intensive. The increasing emphasis on things like combinational treatments, uh, the number of agents under development, uh, as well as the growing requirement for qualitative 3D assays, um, that fully reflect the drug treatment effect means that researchers like yourself are under constant pressure to undertake even more complex and numerous assays. So manual counting of 2D and 3D assays are inherently error prone and resource intensive, as you likely know. For a group to maintain consistency in data acquisition in colony counting based assays often requires that a single well-trained observer uh, counts colonies in hundreds or potentially thousands of cultures. Uh, it's also very resource uh, intensive. The huge time and cost uh, investment of this labor intensive approach are significant. Uh, on top of that, the assay itself really does lack external standards that do not allow for assay calibration or standardization, making validation of clonogenic assays quite difficult. Um, another problem is manual counts have the inherent issue that they cannot provide any additional information beyond colony counts themselves. And while most doing colony counting can attest that they have at least seen that there are differences in colony size distributions, um, this really has never been practically or reliably measurable. So what can be done to help resolve some of these issues? So the way forward. Um, Today we have modern automated colony counting and image analysis systems that offer an efficient and cost effective alternative to manual counting. These systems can deliver a significant reduction in turnaround time of high sample throughput assays. The automated image acquisition and analysis approach to colony counting uh, has been validated and is found to provide a much higher accuracy and precision compared to manual observer counting, which actually reduces both intra and inter-observer variation. Uh, on top of that, these systems use high depth of field imaging and combine them with powerful algorithms leading to unsurpassed colony detection performance. This detection includes the resolution of things like overlapping colonies and differentiation of real colonies from debris or other artifacts. Furthermore, um, today's intelligent systems enable operators to set defined colony threshold for counts. Um, an example of this being the exclusions of colonies based on size or colony shape related parameters, as well as general object detection sensitivity. Now, what's also really nice about automated systems is they allow for repetitive plate counting of non-adherent colonies without the need to stain cells. And as a lot of you probably know, most, say, most stains will impede colonies from being used again, meaning longitudinal studies need more samples to achieve all time points. So by, by providing a standardized method for automated colony formation analysis, uh, your research lab is able to improve its results while reducing the cost of colony counting. And this is really achieved by increasing throughput, consistency, and accuracy of generated results, all while, re all while decreasing workflow demands. So technological advancements have made it possible to integrate other analysis parameters into today's automated colony counting platforms. And what this really does is it gives you novel insights and opportunities to capture and report additional qualitative and quantitative data. Researchers processing colony formation assay samples with automated software can now not only generate total colony counts, uh, but can also collect detailed colony size information. And we're talking about things like diameter or nearest neighbor distance. And you can do this in the form of a mean per plate, a histogram distribution, or even on an individual colony basis. Um, this ability to 
quantitatively measure the effects of therapeutic regimes beyond absolute colony number, but also colony size, makes it possible for research labs like yours to extend the sensitivity of the colony forming assay. This allows researchers to obtain previously unquantifiable information relating to colony growth dynamics. So uh, moving on to data capture and export. So today's uh, sophisticated imaging systems for automated colony counting deliver unparalleled data capture and export capabilities. These extend from basic colony counts and mean colony statistics to full digital image archiving and colony uh, raw data export. Images of colony plates or dishes can be saved in a general purpose bitmap format for presentations or print output into lab documentation. Uh, alternatively, they can be saved in a digital raw image format that supports the processing uh, or, if you need to, reprocessing of samples. So now research labs can visually document findings quickly or submit captured images to multiple research teams. Uh, they can uh, extend these to external agents for independent validation, processing, and assessment. Um, this ability to capture, process, and export data on and offline is a cost-effective and really a fast method of undertaking objective and rigorous double-blind tests and can extend the potential to participate in global and large-scale trials or even pursue uh, new collaborative approaches. So one really large advantage of automated systems is that assays can become reproducible under the same settings regardless of whom the user is. So storing and reapplying defined count parameters to maximize counting proportionality and reproducibility uh, enables participation in large-scale or multi-site research. Uh, these settings can be stored and reutilized in single studies, reducing the complexity of accurately assessing the effects of uh, drugs or combined therapeutic approaches uh, in respect to both dose and time of exposure using fewer culture plates. Uh, count parameters and settings can also be stored and submitted to other teams or personnel, enabling in parallel validation programs or the multiplication of treatment assessment trials. So really what I'd like to do now is I'd like to quickly run through an example of what an actual advanced automated colony counter can do. And today I am going to show you the gel count, which is an automated colony counting platform by Oxford Optronics. And just quickly uh, while we're looking at this, um, there is the hardware component, which is the uh, white box on the uh, left hand side, uh, as well as the software component, which you can see on the right. And just as a preface to me showing you the software, uh, this is a product that we at Syntica do offer, but by no means is the only option for colony counting. Now, while I switch to the software here and have a quick drink of water as I'm starting to get a little bit parched, um, Sam is going to pass along another quick poll and we will uh, resume our webinar uh, following that. Uh, thank you, Justin. Uh, we'd like to know a little bit more about you. So the poll question is, um, what is your role in the lab? Uh, are you a professor, a postdoc, PhD, or master of science candidate, a lab manager, or tech? Uh, and the last option is other. I'm going to give Justin a chance to grab a drink of water and let everyone submit their answers. I think we have mostly everyone. Okie dokie. All right. Uh, I'm going to bring back Justin. Perfect, Sam. Can you? Oh, sorry, Sam. Can you see my uh, my software here? Yes, I can. Wonderful. Okay, so yes, we can uh, absolutely resume here. So, um, here is the uh, gel count software. Uh, effectively, what I'm going to do today is analyze an image that was previously taken by the gel counts hardware component that you can see here. And just for your reference, the hardware component itself can image four six well plates of non-adherent colonies in less than six minutes. And once the settings are all set up, the software can analyze the wells in uh, less than two. So again, what we are looking at here is one six well plate of 3D non-adherent colonies. And we can click through the other wells here. Again, you can see I have all the other wells. Um, further, it's also important to note that I can zoom in and out with this functionality here. Again, or I can just scroll with my mouse. Simple enough. 
So really, I'm going to start moving on to some of the more important aspects. So to actually process an image, uh, we need to tell the software the area that we want to count. And to do this, we are going to apply what we call a cell mask. So that's actually this green circle that you can see uh, around this well here. And basically, the way the mask works is anything within the circle will be counted. Anything on the outside, of course, will not. So the mask can actually be made uh, larger and smaller using the mask radius tool. You can see that. Uh, it can also be moved with the mask moving tool. So once the mask is set uh, on one well, it can be copied across all other wells as well. So just keep that in mind. And once all the masks are correctly placed, um, these masks can be saved for the specific brand of plate you are using for future studies, um, which really should completely remove this step. So I'm actually just going to reload the mask that I saved earlier. So everything is set up perfectly. So load mask, uh, it's this one here. Okay, and now you can see again, my masks will all be perfectly placed. Okay, so let's move on to a bit more uh, functionality here. So next we have the optimizer tool, which gives us the direct uh, access to the fundamental algorithm and colony processing functions. So that brings up that there. And so by clicking this, it opens up all of these tabs, which you can see here. And I'm just going to do the basic settings today, but do realize that there are advanced features which may allow for uh, further control of the colony counting algorithm. Now, just before I move on, I do wanna quickly explain how these tabs work. Um, the tabs themselves are meant to run in a top to bottom fashion, meaning any change that is made to the available settings in an individual tab will have a downstream effect on the tabs below it. So we always start from the top tab and work our way down. And really the idea here is by optimizing and adjusting the tools and functions provided, one will end up with the sort of decision-making by the algorithm that one feels is appropriate for their study. So let's start with the pre-process tab, the one we're in right now. Now there's not really much to say, but there is one function I do wanna measure, or I do wanna mention, which is the measuring tool at the bottom here. So if I turn that on, um, and I'm just going to zoom in a little bit so this is a little bit easier to see. Now once it's switched on, it actually allows me to draw a line across any of the objects on screen. So what I'm going to do, so I've zoomed in a bit, and now I'm going to draw a line across a small colony, and we'll see it gives me a length. So let's just choose a small one. Let's choose this one here. And again, it's, it's a pretty crude tool, but it can give you a small length. And we can see this item is approximately 60, uh, sorry, 87 microns. Now, this can actually be useful because what it allows me to do is select one of the smaller objects like I just did. And now I can go to the colony detection tab, and I can specify a lower limit of approximately 80, which I've already done. Now we can follow the exact same steps as we did for the upper limit as well, but for now we are gonna go with the already set 400 microns. So let's move on. Um, I'm going to now look at edge detection shape, which is the top slider here. And what this is purely looking at is colony, is to detect colonies based on their edges. So how nicely the edges are formed. And really the thing to note here is if we back off the sensitivity, we can see we lose a lot of colonies that should be called colonies. And if we go too far forward, um, actually we'll go even a little further than that. Yeah, we'll pick up a lot of false positives. So just on me, just based on me doing this earlier, I did find that 65, approximately 65, will get me uh, my colonies that I'm looking for, perfect. Now, just as a quick FYI, to a large extent, some of the settings that are used like colony edge detection, like we just used, um, do really need to be tested in a trial and error fashion with your colonies and treatments, um, just to make sure the colony, or just to make sure, sorry, the software is able to detect uh, what you want as to delineate actual colonies from background in any artifacts. So let's move on to center of detection. Um, and what this tells the algorithm is what to consider the center of a colony and what not to. And it can really help with distinguishing close and overlapping colonies, uh, allowing the algorithm to separate them from one another. So similarly, again, if I move the slider too far to the left, we're gonna lose a lot of real colonies. Too far to the right, we may pick up a few that are not colonies. And again, I found for this example, uh, 65 tends to be about where we wanna be. So just quickly, um, so sorry, in this example, uh, again, I'm going to be using 65, okay. Uh, let's last move on. Let's move on to the fine tuning tab, which is this one here. And first, we're going to look at the good edge factor. Uh, this can be useful in removing false positives of an artifact. Uh, it can be used to suppress non-specific detection, especially around colony edges where colonies are not quite round. So, for this example, I'm actually going to move to a spot on the plate that I know this shows us off quite well, which is down here. And again, we're going to be focusing on the kind of darker area in here. 
Um, so in this case, um, we can see, actually, let me just slide, slide to get everything coming up. So we can see that there is colonies here that are not being detected. Uh, again, as we move that slider down, we can start detecting these colonies. But again, we don't want to be picking up false positives. So for this example, I think I saw that 70 is about right to remove uh, many of those false positives. It's just a, it's a nice tool just to really uh, be able to get uh, some of those colonies that might be difficult to, de to detect in these kind of areas. So last, we have overlap controls, as you can see here. Um, and the thing about this is sometimes it's needed and other times it's not, and it really depends on application. Um, when on, one can actually merge overlapping objects, and generally speaking, most users don't need to do this, but there are some instances, of course, where this is needed. So, for example, where we have large semi-diffuse colonies um, that are stained, the algorithm may pick up many colonies where there's just one, and we can use this uh, function to merge them. Uh, for this example at hand, we will leave it off and not merge the centers. Now, what's important to note is once we have worked through the settings that provide the detection rules we're happy with, we can, in a similar fashion as we did with the mask, save these settings for future use. So we can actually save them up here. And I've already done this uh, for this example. Um, but the important thing to note here is once we come back to the gel count in a week or a month later to image similar colonies, you can just use your previously saved mask and setting settings, uh, which should allow you to analyze all of your plates in no time at all. So now I'm going to go to the bottom here and I'm going to click OK. Just move to there and click OK. Sorry, I should have zoomed out a little bit before this. We'll do that in two seconds. And what you can see here, I will slide back up. Sorry. And what you can see here now is that uh, this one well uh, has been completely counted. Um, but as you can see, none of our other wells have. So most importantly, from a data perspective, is that all parameters it, uh, are displayed in this left column here. So you can see things like total counts, uh, our diameter information, our area information, density, and they're all uh, displayed there along with the standard deviations in brackets. So at this, at this stage, as I mentioned, we have only processed one well. And I just want to quickly show you how fast I can analyze this six well plate once everything is set up in the system. So first, um, again, as you saw before, I would load my mask and I would use the mask for this experiment. We'd go okay. Then we'd go to our optimizer. We would go load our settings and here are the settings I saved before. We're gonna load those. We would click okay. Again, it's just gonna count this one, one well and we can go now recount all. And what you'll notice is as it counts each one of these, these will turn red. So there's one, two, three, four, five. Perfect. So now each and every one of them is counted and all of their data is in this uh, side uh, portion here. So just for reference for you, um, if we had four six well plates as opposed to the one that we are counting here, we could pretty easily count them all in under a minute or two. Now, before I move on, uh, there is an option at the bottom here to create a histogram to visualize some of the data parameters like uh, like diameter or nearest neighbor distance and work well as preliminary graphs to let you know what's going on well to well. I'm not really going to focus too much time on them here, but I do want to let you know that that functionality does exist. So next I'm going to move on to really the last piece of functionality with the gel count, which is the ease of exporting data. And what you would do is you would click this save button down down here. Now, just for simplicity's sake, so I don't have to bring up these various files and click through them, I'm actually not going to click this button, but I will show you the type of data that we can generate with a system like this. So I am going to just jump quickly back to my PowerPoint. Just give me a couple seconds. PowerPoint, share. And Sam, if you, you can let me know if I'm not there, but I'm going to start. Um, I, you should be in front of you, should be a picture of uh, two Excel files. And so first, we can simply save our overall well-to-well -well data that we saw before. Uh, so we're talking about things like total counts, diameter information, and nearest neighbor distance, along with their respective standard deviations. Now, what's also important is information like your saved mask and algorithm settings are also provided. So there's no guessing weeks or months down the road about which settings you used in a particular experiment and which to use in your follow-up experiments. So it can absolutely save you time and make life a lot easier. Now, what I think is even more important and may even be more useful to some researchers, you actually have a, uh, access to the full data from each and every counted colonies in a respective well or dish. So here we're looking at well one and well two uh, data, for example. And just so you can follow along, each line of this Excel sheet is the individual information of one counted colony. 
Now, what this means to a researcher like yourself is you actually have the ability to run multivariable statistics across treatments comparing things like survival, volume of colonies, and nearest neighbor distance, which is something that just really isn't possible with the manual counting of colonies. Um, and really what this does is it can make what would normally be a simple colony viability study a much more dynamic experiment by looking at a range of factors and their effects. So the last thing I really do want to show you today is with this type of system, we can also get some actually like really nice images of plates, which are processed and unprocessed, uh, which can be helpful for putting together things like presentations, posters, and publications. Um, it actually also demonstrates to others in your field that you are appropriately counting your colonies and can act as a nice check and balance to your research. So just really to summarize uh, today's talk, um, I first discussed adherent and non-adherent colony assays, and we looked at the many challenges associated with the manual counting of these assays. Um, we then turned to look at the automated counting methods and some of the inherent advantages uh, of them over the manual counting method. I discussed how automated counting can be a timely and cost-effective way to get more informative results. Automated counters also have the advantage of being consistent and reproducible regardless of whom the user is or when they use the platform. Finally, I did finish with a demo of our gel count software to really show you the power of uh, an automated colony counting uh, method. So with that, um, that really is everything I have for today. Um, I do want to thank everybody for watching this presentation. Um, I think we're going to spend the next few minutes trying to answer some questions that have been submitted here. I realize we might be running a tad bit late, but uh, we'll get through those. Um, while I wait for a few questions to roll in, and uh, while I have one more drink here, uh, Sam does have one last poll for you. Thank you, Justin, for that wonderful presentation. And we will uh, run a brief um, Q&A after this poll. Um, I know that we have reached the 30 minute mark. So if you would like to stick around for a few more minutes, uh, we would love to answer a few questions. The last poll is, do you believe your lab group and or other faculty would be open to a future demo of the gel count? And it's basically yes, no, or you would need more information. I'm just gonna keep the poll up for another 20 seconds to let everyone uh, fill it out. Um, and yes, uh, like I mentioned before, we're gonna run a brief Q&A. Uh, mostly everyone has submitted their answers. So I'm going to end this poll and bring back Justin for the Q&A. Justin? Perfect. Yes, yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Um, the first question that I have is, our lab uses Petri dishes for our assays. Can colonies be counted using Petri dishes? Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, so the answer uh, quickly here, here is yes. And uh, just to maybe expand just a tiny bit on that, um, as far as the gel count goes, uh, it can count well plates from 6 to 96. It can do Petri dishes. Uh, it does 35 millimeter, 50 millimeter, and 100 millimeter Petri dishes. And uh, it also has the capability to do certain T25 flasks as well. So that's uh, pretty much all of its capabilities. Okay, thank you. I, I see many more uh, submitting questions. I encourage yeah. everyone to continue. See the next here. question that I see here is uh, how much faster are automated systems than manual counting? Okay, uh, yeah, I think I kind of can't, I think I kind of answered this uh, earlier, but I, I can expand, I guess, a little bit here. Um, I, I don't really want to make too many uh, statements about how fast a manual counter can count because, you know, that's kind of subjective to that person. But um, if you take my example I showed earlier, um, there were about 1,500 colonies per plate. And what I showed was that uh, we could count four six wall plates um, with total consistency in under two minutes. And I guess just as an aside, um, the gel count can both image and count four six wall plates of uh, adherent stained colonies in about six minutes and uh, the freely floating non stained uh, colonies in about 12. So I think that kind of answers that. Justin, is there a minimum size that can be counted? Yeah, again, I don't want to speak to, to, to other colony counters, but uh, the gel count has a resolution of about 30 microns as a minimum. Um, and on that point, um, most people decided that colonies need to be about 50 cells and to be considered a colony. So I think that 30 micron resolution almost should never be a, an issue. Uh, Daniel asked, uh, has the gel count software been used to count bacterial colonies? 
Yeah, so um, th that's actually a really good, good question. Um, yes, it can. It can absolutely. It's not its a primary uh, function, but it absolutely can. And again, as long as that 30 micron limit is met and the colonies have some circularity to them. Um, but yeah, I mean, this, this has been used to count bacterial, uh, yeast, um, uh, spheroids, uh, organoids, and everything in between. Um, yeah, so I would, say, I would say yes. I think I would, uh, yeah, for sure. I think we have time for one more question. I would agree. Um, I think that's right, Sam. Uh, can this count, can the system count stem cell colonies? Uh, yeah, so this kind of depends. Um, it's oftentimes a case by case issue. Um, but the gel count, I, I will say, will not really dependably count highly diffuse colonies or highly irregular colonies. Um, the algorithm really wasn't made for counting based on colony morphology. But honestly, generally what I suggest is if you have a question like that, um, usually what I would suggest is just taking a picture of what you have and I can tell you pretty quickly um, whether it can count it or not. Um, it's more a case-by-case -case basis, I would, I would say. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Justin. We have over 20 more questions that we're going to get to at, after this um, webinar. And as mentioned at the start of our webinar, you know, we will um, answer all these questions at the end and publish it on our website. Uh, I'd like to thank Justin again for the interesting and informative presentation. I'm hopeful that uh, you all will walk away satisfied that we met your learning objectives uh, by highlighting the key differences between manual and automated counting methods the speed and additional information that can be gathered through automated counting. Um, and lastly, how the gel count, a system cited well more than 200 times, has been helping labs remove bias and garner accurate counts for every study. Again, please feel free to reach out to us directly if you have any more questions about anything presented in the webinar or demo today. Thank you again to all of you for taking the time out of your day to attend our session. We look forward to seeing you at a future Syntica instrumentation event. Have a great day, everyone. Goodbye.